Hey, Vlad here, devinsidey.com. Welcome to another video. In the previous video, we talked about what models of computation are. And today, we're going to start talking about the environment model of computation. But as we've seen in the previous video, we need to talk about the substitution model first. <music> As always, we're in the virtual machine, which runs Ubuntu, and we have Sublime Text on the left, and the terminal on the right, which runs SBT, which runs our code for us. And by the way, I'm still a bit sick, so I'm sorry for my voice. Before we begin, I would like to point out that the content in this video, the same as in the previous one, is heavily based uh, on the book SICP, and I usually come up with my own examples, uh, but in this case, I decided to uh, pick exactly the same examples as in the book, uh, just in case uh, if I explain something badly, then you can always go to the book and look it up. Uh, it's a free book, and the link is going to be down in the description. Another thing that I'm going to mention here, which is uh, the same thing that I mentioned in the previous video, is that uh, this book is pretty much concerned with uh, writing your own programming languages. Well, and by that, me I mean uh, writing compilers and writing uh, interpreters for programming languages. And I don't believe that uh, this angle is the best for uh, programming beginners. So uh, I'm going to try to mitigate this issue as much as possible. Let's hope for the best. And by the way, most compilers and interpreters for programming languages are actually built using this environment model of computation. So I highly encourage you to invest some time in to uh, learning about it. I'm 100% sure that it's going to improve the developer inside you. All right, let's begin. Since uh, most models are based on math, they tend to be very minimalistic. It's usually just a, just a few rules. And this, this point is going to be very crucial uh, in a later video once we're going to start talking about paradigms. So just keep it in the back of your head. The substitution model, for example, can be explained in just one sentence. To apply a compound procedure to its arguments, evaluate the body of the procedure with each form of parameter replaced by the corresponding argument. As we've seen in the previous video, the purpose of this model is to help us reason about procedure application. And we have also seen that it can be implemented with two different orders of evaluation, the applicative order and the normal order. So let's start with the simplest one, the applicative order. And because the environment model happens to be built on top of it, this is also the one that is mostly used. So in Scala, uh, we have the substitution model with applicative order and the environment model of computation. This is the example from the book. We have a simple function called square square, uh, which takes an, in an integer and produces an integer, and it squares that integer. We also have a function sum of squares. I'm going to write it on, on the top. Um, it's going to make uh, more sense in a few seconds. Sum of squares. It takes an x, takes a y, and it squares them, squares the x, squares the y, sorry, y, and because it's called sum of squares, it actually sums them together. Then we're going to have another function called just f, because we're going to talk about f uh, in this in this example, and uh, in fact, in many other examples. Uh, it's just a function called f. It takes an integer and produces an integer. And all it does is it calls sum of squares. And uh, before, before passing a to sum of squares, it um, adds 1 to a and it multiplies it by 2 as a second argument. And um, what we're going to do today is we're just going to print line f of 5. And this is also the reason why, why I wrote them in this order. So uh, you see that um, print line calls f, f calls sum of squares, sum of squares calls square two times. The applicative order evaluation, uh, which is also sometimes called a strict order evaluation, but as we've seen in the previous video, the scientific um, name is applicative order um, evaluation. Uh, it, all it means is that the arguments are evaluated first before the sub-procedures are, are evaluated. For example, in, in, in this case, uh, A will be evaluated first, then A plus 1 will be evaluated and then sum of squares will be evaluated, right? And to demonstrate that, uh, what we're going to do over here is uh, we're going to wrap a 5 in a scope. And before we uh, before we give the 5 to f, uh, we're also going to print out 5. I'm going to print it out as a string, right? And then over here, uh, we're going to print line f. Sorry, like that. OK. And over here, we're going to print line sum of squares. And over here, we're going to print line square as a string. All right. So, uh, so what you should see is that the 5 is evaluated first, and then the f is evaluated, and the sum of squares, and then square, and then square. 
a few minutes later you will see that in a normal order evaluation uh, the, the, this this will look a bit different the the actual order of evaluation is, is different okay so uh, the applicative order evaluation uh, basically literally implements the the, the substitution model of computation um, and to demonstrate that uh, we're gonna actually let me because we're gonna we're gonna have a bunch of examples today let me actually wrap this whole thing into its own scope right and let me press enter over here and format that like this and have it over here okay so in this scope uh, if you wanted to evaluate um, f of 5 right uh, what, what we need to do is we need to look at the body of f and we can ignore the print lines okay so we're just gonna um, copy some of squares right and gonna put it over here and now we need to replace the formal parameters with the arguments right so um, a is a 5 right so we're going to go here and put a 5 over here right and the next thing that is going to happen is that it's going to evaluate this which is a 6 and it's going to evaluate that which is a 10 and then we just keep going so what is sum of squares well sum of squares is square of x plus square of y so we copy that paste it over here x becomes a 6 and y becomes a 10 and we just keep going like this uh, what is square square is x times x so we have x times x let me uh, put in braces plus um, another square x times x in this in this case x is a 6 and in this case x is a 10 right so now we have 36 over here plus 100 and this is how we arrive at 136 and the beauty of that is that i can actually uh, go down like this and i can put a print line over here have some parentheses like this and i can save it and everywhere you will see 136 and this is the uh, the beauty of the substitution model and as we can see actually the, the those those print lines they actually break it so if i remove the print lines come out and like that we should see 136 a bunch of times right now i'm going to leave the print lines committed out and in fact i'm also going to uh comment on these print lines uh so that we just have just have this one 136 okay so uh what we're going to do now is um, i'm going to copy paste this entire scope and we're going to talk about the normal order of evaluation now technically um i wanted to focus this video on the environment model of computation and for that we don't really need to understand the normal order evaluation but then i thought since we're already talking about this i'm going to explain this as well now uh because scala is implemented uh, using the applicative order evaluation it's kind of hard to show uh but there but there but there's a trick okay so um first of all we're, we're gonna add those print lines in a second but first let me remove them um so this is just a five and this is gone this is gone and this is gone just so that you can um a bit easier um uh, understand what's what's going to happen so in order to to demonstrate the normal order orderly evalu of evaluation in a language that is using the applicative order evaluation all we need to do is we need to replace all the simple parameters with functions and this is what we're going to do now and by the way we can remove these they're going to they're going to look different anyway um, okay, so the x is going to become a function that doesn't take anything, but it produces an integer, right? And we're going to uh, run this function twice here, one here and one here. And you can also you can already sort of predict the difference between the normal order evaluation and the applicative order evaluation in terms of performance, because in this case, if this is a function and this is called twice, then the the parameter that is that is going to be passed in it's going to also be evaluated twice, and we're going to see this in a few seconds. Okay, so uh, now this is obviously not going to compile, right? Because we're passing an integer to square, but we need to to pass functions, uh, therefore. Uh, this should be a function and this should be a function uh, all these functions are going to have the same type it's going to be not taking anything but producing an integer somehow and notice that in this case we're not actually calling them we're just passing them along right and uh, now we're going to have um, a function over here right 
So um, now we're still doing a plus one, but we need uh, which is an integer, but we need a function that produces an integer, right? So we're just going to create it. It's going to look like this. Arrow to the right. Sorry, like this. Arrow to the right. Now in this case, we're actually going to uh, call a because a is a function, right? So we're calling a. It produces the integer, and now we have this whole thing. And over here, we're going to do the same. It's a function that doesn't take anything, but somehow manages to producing a, uh, to produce an integer by uh, evaluating a and then multiplying by two. Okay, and the same thing over here. So uh, because a is not an integer, it's a, it's a function that produces an integer. I'm gonna do this. Okay, and now I'm gonna add the print lines again. So uh, let me have a scope over here and semicolon, and we're gonna do print line. Same as at the top, print line five. And actually, I'm just gonna start duplicating these. Uh, duplicate and bring it down. Comment in. This one, duplicate, bring it down. Comment in. And this one, duplicate, bring it down and to this. So now if we're gonna run it, we actually uh, arrive also at 136. And by the way, this uh, top one, we can comment it out real quick. So now we have a warning that this scope over here that I'm going to collapse, that it doesn't uh, doesn't do anything. And this is what the warning is about. But now we don't see the first 136. So now, as we can see, we see the f first, then the sum of squares, then the square, the first square, right? And then we see this 5 evaluated, right? So we see the 5 evaluated over here, um, sorry, over, over, over here because we see the print line square and then we see the five and we see the five again okay and now the other time when we're going to go to square uh we're also going to see the square and then we're going to see the five and we're going to see the five the normal order of evaluation is sometimes called a lazy evaluation or delayed evaluation because this is what we're doing with those functions right we're basically delaying the evaluation of five and it works by by fully expanding the procedure first and only uh, then at the very last moment actually evaluating the arguments it's sort of like um, um, you know like in like in physics where you have like uh, one formula here one formula here one formula here and then you put them all together and only only then once you you know once you've run through some uh, reduction steps uh, on, only then you know you give it an argument and then you apply the whole formula sort of at once this is this is sort of what, what's happening and in order to demonstrate that uh, we're going to actually follow sort of the, sa the same pattern as we did before because it is still over here It's still uh, evaluated by, by using the um, the applicative order of evaluation, right? So we can we can do the same trick So the same as we did uh, hold up. Let me actually unfold it So we want to evaluate this right print line um, F of 5, right? So let me Let me do that Sorry that Oh, you're right. Before that, we didn't have the print line, so we want to see we want to see f5. Okay. So uh, in order to do f5, we need to look at the body of f and we need to copy paste it. So we take this and we paste it over here. And now we're going to do the same trick as as we did before. Uh, so we're going to look at the a, uh, which is the formal uh, formal parameter, and we need to replace it with the argument. And by the way, uh, it's actually not f5. It's it's this right this thing okay so a is this thing so um, let me copy that okay let me mark the a both both of them okay I'm gonna have parentheses uh, around them right and now I'm just gonna paste it in over here okay so um, this is an anonymous function right that take, doesn't take anything produces a five after that it is applied to our, to the argument and we're doing plus one plus one and because it doesn't fit anymore, uh, let me actually maximize it, or uh, let me put it to the top and bring this down. Um, because I know this from the past, we're gonna need 131 hyphens. Let me bring it down. So let me just uh, let me just uh, continue doing this. So sum of squares. What's what's the body of sum of sum of squares? Well, it's square x plus square y. So let's do this. Right. So what is our x? Well, this whole thing is our x. Let's go in put it in there um, this is our y uh, like this until here so this is our y okay and the next one is what is our square well our square is this 
okay so what is our x our x is this thing right so we have our x i'm gonna mark the x i'm gonna surround it with parentheses i'm gonna paste it in now this is only the first square right this is this what we just did is only this so uh let me surround it with parentheses let me have it plus right and let me put the square in again which is this and in this case our square um i'm sorry our x is this so i'm going to surround it with parentheses and i'm going to paste it in so this this formula is now is now fully expanded and the cool thing is that um if i if i remove print lines again i remove this one this one this one and this whole thing over here right so uh, first of all everything still compiles right and if i do the same trick was print lines over here so i'm going to do print line op open uh, parenthesis going to the end closing the parenthesis if i run this thing again it should still give us 136 and this is the beauty of the substitution model of uh, computation right it doesn't matter which order uh, we always arrive at 136 we don't always arrive at the same thing by the way uh, which is something that, that i'm going to show in a few minutes so we've seen the applicative order and we've seen the uh, normal order. Let me comment this out. And because, uh, so Scala uses the applicative order as we've already seen, uh, but because Scala is such a wonderful language, it actually has a very beautiful syntax for uh, mi mimicking the normal order. So what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna go, um, actually let me, let me put it to the left again. I kind of prefer it, okay? Uh, let me save it and then we're gonna see this whole thing like this and we have too many hyphens. Right, so this is gonna look much better. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the very first example, this one, right? And I'm gonna collapse this. Uh, I'm gonna collapse that. And let's have another scope over here. And I'm gonna paste it. And we can we can uh, enable those print lines. Actually, it's uh, not a big deal. So what I'm gonna show you now is that if we just add in very specific places and um hold up over here over here and over here and over here right so if we just add an arrow over here then scala will switch basically uh to the normal order evaluation right so um you should see the print lines exactly the same way as you have seen them with um was um, manual normal order evaluation but the syntax it almost looks example exactly the same as uh, for the regular applicative order so um let me actually let me, let's do this let's have a uh, print line and this hyphen times uh let's do another 50 and let's go in here and actually enable uh these print lines whoops this one this one this one and this one right so again manual normal normal order evaluation uh where we have those uh, uh lambdas flying around everywhere and we have applicative order looking uh syntax with just a few arrows and it should still look exactly the same so we have f f sum of squares sum of squares square square five 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 square five five so it looks exactly the same. Before we continue, let me actually go back uh, real quick because I sort of forgot to, um, to to explain this a bit better. So uh, first of all, uh, let me expand this. So uh, let me enable this. So if you if you look closely, this is the the fully expanded um, uh, formula, so to say, right? And if you look closely, you see the five four times, and this is why you also see the five uh, four times in the print line, right? One, two, three, four so uh this is the the, the normal order uh, evaluation works in such a way that it, that it fully expands everything and then uh the reductions follow so uh these these were the expansions expansions and over here we're gonna have the reductions and for the reductions i'm just gonna copy uh, this whole expression over here kind of paste it here so the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to uh do this these five places it's going to uh, reduce them to a five and then uh, it's going to take uh, these two it's going to reduce them to a six and it's going to take these two and reduce them to a ten now it's going to uh, let me see uh, take these two 
and reduce them to sixes and it's gonna look at oh yeah i forgot to add the parentheses uh, around this this whole expression so um the right part should have had those parentheses okay uh, which is which got me confused so it's gonna take these two and it's gonna reduce them to 10 right and uh, after that it's gonna do the same as, as before right so it's gonna do 136 plus 100 um sorry just 36 and now it's gonna have 136 did i do this wrong uh, over there as well hold up no i didn't all right so now we have the applicative order we have the manual uh normal order and i probably should comment down these things over here and that okay and we have also the automatic order uh, I call it automatic normal order evaluation because uh, we have syntax trigger for that. Okay, so let me collapse Sublime again like this. Uh, let's save it. And uh, maybe also let's remove this print line. We don't, we don't actually need it. In fact, let me also comment out all of these other uh, print lines. Uh, or, or actually, you know, we're, we're kind of done with this example. So I'm just going to do this. And um, the same here. Going to do that. Okay and maybe just to remove the warning should also do that all right and also the warning is gone i'm going to keep them here uh, just in case though if we if we have to go back and talk about it again as we have seen uh, the normal order evaluation it, it evaluates some um, some expressions uh, more than once and your um, intuition that um, this is last performant is not entirely incorrect so um, the thing is that this this model of evaluation uh, it really shines with stream processing, uh, which is unfortunately not really adopted in our, in in the, in the industry. Uh, the the environment model is, but at least it's kind of nice to know that you can regain a bit of control um, over the evaluation order if 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 you wanted to, uh, especially in Scala when when you have such such a beautiful syntax to do that. Here are the key points that you need to know about the differences between the normal order and the applicative order. Uh, first of all, the applicative order is sort of more performant by default because the expressions have to be evaluated only once, which is also the reason why most languages uh, go with that. Number two, normal order evaluation is very useful for stream processing, which is another organizational strategy and alternative to the environment model uh, that we learned about in the previous video. Number three, they look as if they always do the same thing, uh, but in fact, they don't always yield the same results, uh, which is something that we're going to see in a few seconds. Number four, in a few minutes, we're going to finally learn about the environment model of computation and the only reason we need it. And by the way, if you remember only one thing from this video, please remember this. The only reason why you need the environment model of computation is because our language allows assignment. So it has the assignment operator. And if you have assignment, then uh, you basically uh, end up programming with mutable state. And mutable state does not play well with normal order evalu evaluation, which is why most languages they use the applicative order and they use the environment model. I'm not going to demonstrate um, how exactly it doesn't play well with normal auto evaluation because this video is already getting kind of long. And um, again, I wanted to really center it on the environment model of computation. So uh, let's just have this example real quick uh, where, where the normal auto evaluation and the applicative auto evaluation don't, don't yield the same results. And this example is uh, also taken from the book and it can uh, it can be seen as a test um, to, to test your new language. So let's say you're learning a new language and you're not sure um, how it's implemented. Does it use the applicative order or does it use the normal order? And you can, you can use this test to, to do that. So let's have another scope. And um, the test uh, takes a form in a function of a, of a function, right? Because you know, if you want to test the order of evaluation, you need, you need, a, you need a function, a procedure. So uh, it's going to take two integers, and it's going to have uh, the one is going to be called if clause, and the other one is going to be called as clause, else clause, uh, which takes an integer. And the whole function produces an integer, OK? And all it's doing is it says, OK, so if, if clause equals 0, I'm sorry, equals 0, uh, then return if clause. Otherwise, return return else clause. And that's it. So the, the, the trick here is that for, for arguments, uh, you're going to have um, overflow, uh, which is just an integer, right? So you're going to print, print out overflow. And because Scala eliminates tail calls, uh, we can't have uh, this function tail recursive. So we're going to have overflow plus one. In fact, a bit later, uh, we're going to use uh, an, an endless loop, an endless loop over here, uh, which is going to do the same thing, right? It's going to print out endless loop, and it's going to have uh, just going to return. I'm sorry, an endless loop. 
Okay, and this one is going to be uh, tail uh, call eliminated. I used to say optimized. Um, let's go annotation tail rag, and Scala has an annotation um, that. Uh, if you think that you have a um, a tail recursive function, then uh, the if you add this annotation, the compiler will warn you if it actually is not a tail recursive function, right? So we have this, and it should compile. Uh, everything should be just fine, okay? So now we're actually going to call test. So now we're calling test, and the if clause parameter. Oh, actually, let's let's print out whatever comes back, right? Because we you know we, we want this integer, okay? Uh, so the if clause. Is going to be a zero, right? So we we want it basically to jump in over here, and we want it to sort of we want to see if it's going to ignore the else clause or not. And the way we see if it ignores it is by giving it something evil, right? So we're going to say the else clause is an overflow, right? Because an overflow is just an integer. So if we run that, we're going to see an overflow, it's a stack overflow. And if we run the other one, let me comment this out. Uh, if we run the endless loop, then we're going to see an endless loop, which is also the reason why the print line is there. And uh, now I actually have to kill this PT and go back in. And I'm not going to do toga run. Well, I'm going to tap it in. I'm not going to press enter, right? So let me duplicate that. So in the last case, uh, we're actually going to say that the, the else clause is, I don't know, like a two or something, right? So um, Let's run it, and now we're going to see that it uh, it just goes into the else clause. Okay, so if it if it if it was normal order of evaluation, it would not it would not uh, evaluate this expression, right? And we can actually demonstrate this because we, we already learned how to how to how to sort of enforce normal order of evaluation um, by just adding arrows over here, right? Uh, arrow. Technically, we don't we don't even need uh, the first one because uh, as of right now, the first argument is always zero in our case. So so the second one is enough. Right, so if we do that, it runs a fine with a two. It runs a fine with an endless loop, and it runs fine with an overflow. Right, because it doesn't, because it never goes there. It never, it never calls uh, this sort of function. Right, because remember, like the syntax in the back, um, uh, what's going to happen at the back end is it is actually going to convert this into a function. Right, so it will just not call this function. Ah, come on, like this. Okay, so um, so yeah, uh, let me comment that out actually. Right? So this is this is the way how you test uh, in your language. Does it use the applicative order or does it use a normal order? Actually, let me comment these in so that I can collapse this whole scope like this. Come on, doesn't allow me to collapse it now. Do I have to save it? Nope. Do I have to align that? Maybe now I can collapse it. There we go. Yeah, now I can collapse it. Okay, so we have four collapse scopes. All right, let's finally start talking about the environment model of computation, which is not a simple one, by the way. I um, I really had to uh, read, uh, reread uh, those, those chapters from the book uh, while, while I was preparing for this video, and it took took forever. Okay, so as I just said, the the, the whole need for the environment model um, is only is only there uh, if we have a, an assignment operator in language. So in Scala, the assignment operator happens to be the same one as the binding operator. Uh, let's demonstrate that. So we're going to have a var x equals 5, and then later we're going to assign a different value to x. Okay. So in this case, the equal sign uh, means binding, um, let's call it say new binding or um, initialization. And in this case, where, where there's no var or val or def, uh, in this case, equal sign uh, means assignment right which technically reassigns the value okay so it's it's the same symbol uh, but it's doing something else in some some other languages they, they actually use a different uh, symbol for assignment for example they would do something like this let's revert that okay and let's actually print out X it's a very beautiful code I don't know why I'm indented like this kind of feels feels right somehow okay so it's actually going to print out um, the uh, the six and in this case the substitution model is simply not enough because uh, it has to somehow distinguish um, this x from from that x uh, once it inserts it over here now your intuition uh, might be that you know the, the the time is of essence and you're not completely wrong uh, because basically you know you would look at this and be like yeah just take the last one well it sort of makes sense but we need something more formal uh, to implement a compiler or interpreter which is um, Again, the main topic of the of the book, uh, which is which is not something that you really really super need to understand as a beginner, uh, but as I argued in in my previous video, it's not gonna hurt you. Okay.
but just don't worry don't worry too much if, if if this gets too hairy okay so to summarize this new model of evaluation is required because x uh, cannot be merely considered as a name for a value it is something else it, it is it also needs uh, some sort of like a place where you can where you can store values and uh, this place um, which, which is going to be called the environment in this model of computation so uh, we're just going to do uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to do we're going to take square one of those squares uh where is it it's over here i'm just going to copy that and we're going to paste it over here we don't we don't need this thing and in fact let me let me just leave it here let's have another scope let's collapse this one uh, let's put our square in there uh, which is indented weirdly okay so technically there's no there's no assignment over here in in, in square um, uh, but we're just gonna we're just gonna use it as an example first now when the compiler looks at square uh, what it, what is actually doing behind the scenes it, it it is doing that it actually adds adds a binding for square so it says square is of type int to int I'm sorry int and it equals x arrow to the right x time x so uh, you can always refer to to this body by by the name of square and this is just a shorter shorter version of this um, val square and int equals and over here uh, we're going to define a lambda and in the end we're going to return this lambda and this lambda is going to have the same type because it is the same lambda right so we're going to have x x time x right so it doesn't matter which one i take uh let's take the last one for example right so uh, i can do print line square of five for example right it's just going to do five times five is, is 25. uh let's take this one now uh this one same thing and now let's take this one also same thing okay and let's go back to the big one now there we go we're actually going to see in a few minutes that this is not just a simple lambda that it's actually a closure that we discussed in, in this video over there so in the environment model of evaluation a procedure is always a pair which contain which consists of uh, some code and and sort of like an invisible pointer to an outside environment and in scala uh, you sort of already have this uh, feeling right that the environments that they are uh, denoted with with scopes right so environments and scope they're basically the same thing so i'm just going to call this um, environment I'm just going to call it E0, right? So when the compiler looks at this procedure, it 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 um, it, it creates sort of like a table and puts in a, a pair in there, a pair which contains uh, the, the first element contains this this whole code, just just literally the text of this, and it, it remembers the name of the envi environment, which is E0. So um, there there's always a pointer from from this to to E0. So we basically need to understand two things how how environments are created which i sort of vaguely explain right now and also later how um how procedures are, are applied to arguments okay so um as, as i said they're created by by creating this tuple so uh let me actually let me actually remove that so i'm just gonna have some some comments over here Right? So what it's going to do is um, it's going to say, okay, so uh, parameters is x, and it's going to remember the body, uh, the body of this lambda, right? It's going to say body is x time x, right? And as I already mentioned, um, plus an invisible pointer to e zero. Now comes the interesting part. Uh, in order to apply this procedure to, to, to the arguments, the first thing that you need to do is you need to create yet another environment, right? You need to create yet another environment, and this environment uh, will, ha will have as a, a sort of like as an enclosing environment the environment in which this procedure was created, and it was created in, in, the, in the environment E0, right? So let's demonstrate that. So uh, let's look at this code, print line square 5. I mean, we can always sort of ignore the print line right so if it's just a just a square five what it will do is it will create another environment it will call it e1 e1 right i mean it's not actually going to call it e1 i'm just calling it e1 over this so it sends for environment one this one sends for environment zero this one sends for environment one okay so what it will do then it will create a binding for the parameter right so it knows that the parameter is x so it's just going to say x equals five right and it knows that um the that the body 
that the body is uh, x time time x. Okay, so uh, what it will do is it will replace uh, the x's with fives. Right, it's gonna do this. The rest is sort of like the substitution model, right? So it's gonna do the twenty-five, and then somehow magically uh, this value gets returned to the point where where it was called, which which is not really, doesn't really matter in this case. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take our our very original example, uh, you know, the one with sum of squares and everything, 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 and we're gonna see how it is evaluated in terms of the environment model of computation, which is not super useful uh, because uh, again the the need for the environment model is the um, the presence of assignment, and this example does not contain assignment but it is still a very very simple example and therefore we're gonna use that okay so uh, let me see let me let me comment this out uh, let me actually collapse that one um, let's have another scope and let's uh, go over here uh, let me copy that paste it over here just so that we can see it uh, and enable it like this uh, let's actually remove those print lines. Uh, let's remove that like this. We remove those unnecessary mm, curly braces. I have a friend who calls them flower brackets. She's probably watching this video right now. Hey. So when the compiler wants to evaluate that, uh, what it does is it creates another environment, right? It calls it. Um, let me just actually say environment e1 is created. Okay. And over here it's doing while a equals five, right? And then it's doing result equals sum of squares of a plus one a times two. Uh, we're not gonna write out the rest because it's um, because it doesn't 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 really matter. And, and also um, again it, it doesn't doesn't really matter how how the results sort of are getting pieced together later. Okay, so uh, later what it's doing is it it creates the in the next environment, right? environment e2 is created and e2 contains um, well x which is uh, in our case a6 right this one and it has well y equals 10 okay and it has a result uh, which is square of x plus square of y the next thing is the third environment is created environment e3 is created and in this case x equals 6 right? and the result is x times x let me actually scroll down a little bit right and in this case the next environment is created environment e4 and let me actually copy that and paste it over here like this close and in this in this case x is a 10 and the the crucial point sort of to notice is that uh, you have you have the name of x in every you know in almost every environment right so we have an x over here we have an x over here and we have an x over here um, but because our, our our procedure is always a pair of um, of the code and the place right so the pointer to the environment uh, it can actually distinguish between them right so it's different x's now these environment frames they're they're sort of like just like lookup tables uh, this is this is literally how compilers are interpreted like every time uh, for, for, for every scope a compiler keeps, keeps track of a table with basically names of variables and, and their values right and then uh, whenever you want to um, uh, you, you want to reassign a, a value to, to something what it does is is um, the, those, those scopes those environments they're, they're basically hierarchical right so it looks um, in in the in the first scope if, if it contains the binding for 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 X like for example if you if you were here and there was an assignment for X it will start looking for X in the scope and it will find it but if it didn't find it right so for example if we did if it did here something like y equals uh, five or something, right? It will look at this in this environment. It, it will it will not find the y. Then it will it would start looking at the at the at the um, uh, sort of the, the the parent environment, right? Because there will be always a pointer uh, pointing to this outside environment, right? And somewhere here, it will hope that it will look uh, well for for it will, it will find the binding for for y, y right so um it doesn't matter which 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 value it is right it will find the binding for y and in this frame and it will it will change change it okay uh let's actually not get distracted let's remove that okay and here we go this 136 is still coming from this print line over here okay 
let's actually finally have a, a useful example, an example which is actually uh, where the environment model is actually necessary. So uh, we're going we're gonna to take this square from, uh, let me comment out all of this. And let's collapse it like this. Uh, let me find the square, the, the, the one that contains the closure. Um, nope, not here. It's over here. Oh yeah, this one. This is the one that we need. So uh, we're going to use this as an example. So let's comment it out. Um, clips. Let's have another one. Okay. So uh, we're going to have it. We're going to have it over here. Hold up like this. Okay. So in this example, uh, we're, we're going to use this as sort of like a template and I'm just going to keep uh, massaging this code until it becomes something else. So we're going to have, we're going to implement a partial bank account. So with a regular bank account, you can uh, look at your balance. You can uh, make a transfer. Uh, you can deposit money. You can you can withdraw money, right? Um, with this bank account, is only going to have one operation. It, it will only um, uh, be capable of uh, withdrawing money, and therefore we're not going to call going to call it bank account, bank account. We're going to call it uh, make withdraw. So it's going to create the operation that can do uh, that can withdraw money. So it's not going to be called square, as I said. It's going to be called make withdraw, and our lambda is actually going to be withdraw, right? So. It's going to create this withdraw operation and it will uh, return as well. The parameter is going to be called amount. And there will be a variable called balance laying over here, right? And the balance is just an integer and it's going to have an initial balance, right? Its value is going to be the initial balance. And the in initial balance will come as a parameter over here, right? So we're going to have initial balance, initial balance, oh initial balance which is an integer and now because we have a parameter this has to become a def okay and now we have we have also um, fixed the the syntax highlighting now what withdrawal will do it will check if the current balance is greater or equals uh, whatever the amount we want to withdraw and if this is the case then it will assign a different value to balance it will say balance equals balance minus amount okay and um, otherwise, uh, and also it, it has to return the balance, right? It has to return the balance because it has to return this integer, okay? And otherwise, it will just signal an error by doing this error, um, insufficient, insufficient funds, okay? And I believe in this case, we're actually done. So let's see if it compiles. Yes, it compiles, okay? So now uh, over here, we're gonna actually create a, a withdraw. We're gonna withdraw. We're going to call it withdraw one because in a few minutes we're going to have a withdraw two. Okay, so we're going to do make withdraw and the initial balance balance is a hundred. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to print out um, withdraw of 10, right? Which is going to do behind the scenes 100 minus 10 and equals 90, um, which is a uh, very high tech math. Okay, and then it's going to also withdraw 15. Right, and uh, because the the state is being remembered, it's being capped, uh, it's being captured in, in, in balance over here. Uh, it will start doing with ninety, right? So it's going to do ninety. I'm sorry, ninety minus fifteen equals equals seventy five. Let's see. Now you actually see the environment model of computation um, in in action. At some point over here, uh, for example, over here, right? At some point, it's going to say balance equals 100 minus 10. Actually, let me do let me do 100 over here like this, right? So what it will do is it will say, okay, so this is an assignment, right? And therefore, it's going to start looking for balance in this scope and in this environment, and it's not going to find it, right? But because this was defined in this environment, it's going to keep looking further, and it's going to locate this, right? So it's going to find the binding, the initial binding for balance, and it will just change it. Right. So this is this is literally how the environment model of computation works, and this is uh, literally why it is required. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to have a second withdrawal, and then we're going to demonstrate how the substitution model is being broken by this single tiny assignment operator. So uh, let me just duplicate this code, and we're going to have a withdrawal two. Okay. Well, let's just uh, withdraw twenty, for example. So let's print li print line um, withdraw two twenty. Right, so let me actually copy that, put it over here. So it's actually going to do this. It's actually going to do that. So they sort of they sort of live um, 
in independently uh, from each other well that really scared me i just i just left this code over here <laughs> can't do that all right so we have this and actually let me have a let me have a line over here right so we see this this was the first one and this is the second one so they live sort of in in their own uh, universes right in their own environments in their own scopes and by the way we've been using scopes since since um since day one basically how cool is that so the substitution model uh basically says that uh whenever whenever you you call a function you can just uh replace uh, or you can just rewrite that piece of code with the value that this function produces, right? It also means that you can do it the other way around, right? So for example, um, these two pieces of code are exactly the same, right? But if I take this and I replace that, I rewrite that, I substitute that, the code will not behave the same. So now, instead of this, it's going to do 55, right? Because now, uh, withdraw2 is just a different name for withdraw1. So uh, what is that, uh, what, what ends up happening here is, that we have a 75 75 what is wrong 75 minus 20 come on and therefore we have the 55 also notice sort of sort of like as a sidebar um the environment model of computation is is the the basis uh the basis for uh for garbage collection right so um at some point uh for example over here where this brace ends right it knows that for the environments that have been created here for this one and Again, let me let me actually do this one. So for, for both of these two environments, there are no more references, right? So there's no no, no pointer anymore. Nothing 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 points to them anymore, and therefore uh, garbage collection can can run at some point later, and it will know that it can uh, remove those environments, right? So it can free the memory, which is good. And uh, not understanding the environment model of computation uh, basically will lead you uh, occasionally to uh, memory leaks. Right, so um, in Scala you have garbage collection, you have managed memory, but it does not mean that you cannot have memory leaks. It's very easy to show. All right, we're basically at the end of this video. Uh, let me just say a few a few things. So um, the environment model of computation and the which comes basically because of assignment, it raises a lot of very uh, very difficult questions. Like for example, the, the whole notion of equality is now is now. Um, it's now way more complicated. So before, you know, every time you're creating, you're creating a, a val, right? So you, you're just basically giving a name to some piece of code. Right now, it's more complicated. It's not just a name. It, it is a pair pair of a name and a pointer to some environment, right? So now, for example, um, what should happen if you compare it to bank accounts? It's a complicated question. There are there are a lot of solutions for this, uh, but it's but it's definitely harder than the substitution model. Just remember that the environment model of computation is not there to make your life harder. It is an organizational strategy for your code, uh, which which basically says, okay, if you have some data and you have some operations that uh, that work on that data, put them into the same place and put them into the same environment. This is what the, this is what it's for. It's an organizational strategy. Next thing is. Um, this is a very theoretical topic. I, I understand it's very theoretical. It's very abstract. It's not so easy to understand. Uh, this is why I base it on a book so that you can always um, look it up in, in, in a book. As the last two pieces of advice, um, let me leave you with some, some guidance. So uh, lately, assignment and mutable state, they have been really frowned upon. And my advice for you is not to not to demonize it. So um, uh, assignment comes at a cost, uh, but you just need a few years of experience to, to find out how, how high really that cost is. Um, in the meantime, uh, please don't obsess over uh, refactoring some function uh, for, for hours just to get rid of assignment, okay? Um, it is a tool, it has benefits. Uh, you just need some experience to figure out um, what the cost is. The last point is that uh, the substitution model of computation, um, because you know the mutable state is, is being frowned upon, the, uh, the the substitution model of computation, which is much simpler and I, you know it's, it's it's sort of better, but it can't do everything, right? It's also being sort of shoved into everyone's uh, fro uh, throats these days, and um, I, don't, I honestly don't believe this that this is the way to go. Um, my biggest problem with this is that um, those two models of computation, the substitution and the environment, uh, as we have learned already, they have two very different goals. So one is there to help us to reason about procedure application, and the other one is an organizational strategy. So comparing them, it, it's it's actually kind of silly, right? On the other hand, comparing the environment model with the stream processing model. Uh, that's fair game, but stream processing is a topic for another video. All right, enough talking. I know it was a complicated video, but I still hope that you liked it. Uh, subscribe if you're new here, if you want to improve the developer inside you. Cheers.